So and I'm in the rest of the thorax. So ahead again, as I said last time, you know, we try our best to just focus on the things that are most important to the exam specifically. But you had that's like not that important or just usually isn't focused on, you know, we skip it. Attention at time and action. Um, we're trying to make sure that you guys don't fill your brain with information that you don't need right now, and you leave space for head and neck. So for thorax, and later we're going to be talking about the pleura, lungs, pericardium, the heart, and we're also going to be talking about some important clinical correlations because a lot of the exam is actually clinical questions more than it is um, theory. So it's important for you guys to know a few clinical facts and not just the mom. So um, again, uh, if you find a topic or a part that has a star on it, it's usually more important and there's usually more questions in it than the rest of it. So if you see a star, that means there's probably one question in it in the exam, usually. So the first thing we'll start with is the plural. Um, reminder that if you don't understand the part or if I'm going too fast, just stop me at any time. Right. So we'll start with the plural. And the pleura and things that are usually asked about are the surface anatomy of the pleura, the costa the, the pragmatic recess, uh, the pulmonary ligament, and clinically, they ask about pleural effusion. So we're going to be talking about these four things. The blood supply, innervation, all of these things when it comes to pleura are not that important. So Ahmad a surface anatomy, costa the pragmatic recess, pulmonary ligament, and pleural effusion. So we'll start with the surface anatomy. You know, the surface anatomy is a bit confusing for a lot of people because you have to memorize both the surface anatomy of the pleura and of the lungs. But the best way to remember it is just to remember that the pleura is outside the lungs and the lung is inside, right? So that means that the pleura is probably going to be reaching a higher number than the lungs. Or like a surface anatomy is going to be more than the lung. So if you memorize one of the other, if you memorize one, you automatically know the other one. And I'll, 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 I usually memorize the plural, and then I subtract two to get the lung. I'll explain it in a bit. And for example, the apex of the, surf, uh, of the plural starts one inch above the medial third of the clavicle. That's not that important. And then anteriorly, you know, anteriorly left and right are different because in the left lung, to the heart. The left plural, to the heart. I think the anterior, the right, mapi. So due to the heart, the left extends to the fourth costal cartilage and then deviates to the left and then goes down to the sixth to form the cardiac notch. So basically it'll go down and then when it reaches the fourth, it'll go to the left and then continue to the sixth and, and then stop. Therefore forming the cardiac notch, which is right here, the cardiac notch. Uh -huh. So that's like the only thing you need to know in Newt. Okay, I'll repeat again, because some people said they can't hear. But when a surface anatomy of the uh, pleura, an important one about it is the inferior, after the after the apex and anterior and the anteriors. But when it comes to the apex, it's just above the clavicle. So it's one inch above the clavicle. The anterior one, the thing you really need to know is that it stops at the sixth, um, at the sixth uh, coastal cartilage. But the important thing is that in the left, at the fourth, it goes one inch to the left. Action to form the cardiac notch, so it doesn't go straight till the sixth, it stops. While in the right, it just goes straight to the sixth. You know? yeah, and on the left, to cardiac notch, on the right, mapi. Cool. And then the inferior. The inferior is the one that actually matters because it's the one with most questions on it. What basically happens is in no, al pleura is like, an inferior border of the pleura is, is um, curved, it's not straight. So at each level, it'll hit a specific level. Yeah, it, it won't be on one uh, rib level at all, uh, at all um, spaces. Anteriorly, it will at some area. Um, in the middle, it'll be in an area. And then posteriorly, it'll be in an area. So um, if you can imagine it, it, it curves. If the mid-clavicular line, it'll be at the eighth rib. I can see a mid-axillary line, it'll be at the tenth rib. And posteriorly at the back, it'll be at the twelfth rib. So, and I always memorize it as 8, 10, 12. Cool. So in the front, so mid-clavicular line, it's at the 8th rib. In the middle, which is the mid-axillary line, it's the 10th rib. And then posteriorly in the back, it's the 12th rib. 8, 10, 12. 
Make sense? Yeah. So this is basically a surface anatomy. As I said, you're supposed to just know the inferior one mostly. They're the inferior one because sometimes they ask you questions about, like, for example, someone getting stabbed in the, with a knife or some, some scenario, and they'd ask you, is their, is their pleura getting damaged in this specific area? So for example, they'd be like, someone got stabbed in the back at the level of um, T8 or T10. Is there pleura? And your answer would be yes, because the pleura extends all the way to the 12th rib at the back. I think if the person was stabbed in the 12th rib for anteriorly, it would not puncture the pleura because the pleura only stops at the 8th rib. Make sense? And it's just important to know where the pleura ends at each level, be imperially. Come on. Okay. But fitani, al um, pleura itself, you can just give it a brief talk about it. So the pleura is divided into parietal and visceral pleura. The parietal is the one that reflects along the um, ribs or the rib cage, while the visceral is the one that's reflected on the lung itself. Uh -huh. And parietal itself can be divided into cervical, coastal, diaphragmatic, and mediastinal. So I'll draw it as well. So there's this part, the bottom part, we call it the diaphragmatic part. The part that goes along the ribs, we call it the coastal part. The part that goes along the uh, mediastinum is called the mediastinal part. And then the part that's at the top is called the cervical part. Okay? So it's not important to know these except for this area specifically, because the area where the uh, coastal part and the diaphragmatic part meet is called the coastal diaphragmatic recess. It's important for clinical reasons. Okay? So this is the main, th main thing you should know. Tani, blood supply, innervation, all of these things, just remember that the parietal is similar to the rib cage, while the visceral is similar to the lung. And you don't stress too much about memorizing it, just know, you know the parietal is probably going to get innervated the same way as the rib cage. So it'll probably be the intracostal vessels and so on. While the visceral gets supplied same as the lung, so it'll probably be the pulmonary and so on. Make sense? Yeah, and you try your best to just understand it more than memorize it. So, Can you repeat so the last part? Yeah, of course. So I said the last thing was that the parietal and visceral when it comes to their blood supply and innervation and venous drainage and everything, just remember that the parietal is closely related to the ribs. So it'll take the same blood supply and innervation and venous drainage as the ribs, while the visceral is really close to the uh, lung. So it'll get the same innervation, blood supply, and venous drainage as the lungs. Uh -huh. So you can't feel your lung, right? So you can't feel your visceral. Like you can feel your ribs, so you would feel your parietal. Make sense? But another thing the thing that's really important here, which is called the costodiaphragmatic recess, it's basically as I just said, it's a space between the pleural, uh, sorry, the parietal um, costal pleura with diaphragmatic pleura. So there are two parietal pleuras, the costal and the di diaphragmatic. They both meet and they form this uh, recess. So it's something like this. This area here would be the di costal diaphragmatic recess. Now in this area, there's a small amount of fluid or small layer of pleural fluid that's normally there. Uh -huh. However, it's important to know if the fluid is too much, it'll be visible or accumulate in this area. And if there's a lot of fluid, for example, in pleural fusion, that area is going to be filled with the fluid. Normally, it's not. Normally, during expiration, it's empty. So during expiration, this area is completely empty. During inspiration, it's filled by the lung. Okay, so the coastal diaphragmatic recess during inspiration, when the lung is expanding, it'll be filled with the lung. But during expiration, it's supposed to be empty in normal people. Well, 
If it's not empty with expiration, it means there's something that's accumulating there, or there's a substance that's there. And that would indicate pleural effusion. So if you see a costodiaphragmatic recess that has any form of fluid, any form of substance, it would probably indicate pleural effusion. You'll find it sometimes for questions, be the clinical questions, they just mention, you know, the costodiaphragmatic recess has fluid in it, and so on, okay? So usually you see this on x-rays. So if you do an x-ray, and you see a fluid effusion in the course of the aphragmatic recess, and you see a fluid in the course of the aphragmatic recess, that means the person has a fluid effusion. You know, the question mostly would be the R, like sometimes the patient comes up in x-rays, they'd give you the x-ray, and they'd actually like label this area. And they'd ask you what it is. And this area specifically is the course of the aphragmatic recess. And they can ask you what's the clinical importance of it. And you'd answer in the clinical importance is that it's, it's uh, on x-rays for plural effusions. So it's like visible on x-rays for pleural vision. Oh, so yeah, it's a very common question. And this is the area. Come on. So like this is a question for DR usually during the x-ray station. They could ask you for the, the costodiaphragmatic recess. Clear? Come on. So next thing we'll talk about is the pleural effusion itself and what it is. So pleural effusion is an abnormal accumulation of fluid in the pleural space. And causes are not that important. You know, it could be inflammation, malignancies, or cancers, congestive heart failure, and so on. And what happens is that the fluid is found in the costodiaphragmatic the pragmatic recess on the chest x-ray. So this is just a summary of the things I've been saying. There are a lot of other types of things or fluids or substances that can be found in the pleural cavity other than pleural fusion. So there's hemothorax, which is basically a collection of blood in the pleural space. So that becomes if the object punctures the blood vessels. So if you stab someone with a knife and the knife touches or punctures the uh, intercostal blood vessels, you'll get hemothorax. Come on. Hemothorax, not if you blood in the plural space. One that sounds like it, it's my pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is when there is air in the plural space. So it becomes air in the plural space. After you all you punctured the plural. And you allowed air in, the knife is that. So the knife allowed air in, but not blood. There's not, there is no vessel that got damaged. So there's air in the thorax. Come on. See a third one. It's my empyema. And empyema is basically a connection of pus in the pleural space. So due to infection, the kumpi pus and the pus is found in the um, pleural space. Because it's my empyema. It's not that important. More important ones are hemothorax, pneumothorax, and pleural effusion. So, so the, the, the treatment of all of these is that you're supposed to drain out the fluid, whatever the fluid is, or the air or whatever the substance that's found inside. So in the two types of treatments in this situation, we have something that's called a needle thoracostomy, and there's a tube thoracostomy. So the needle is basically that you insert the needle at the, this is specifically a needle is usually for um, for pleura, uh, for I'm sorry for pneumothorax. So when there's air, you're just trying to get the air out. So you do a needle thoracostomy. The needle thoracostomy is basically you insert the needle in the second intercostal space and to your axillary line. So around here, you insert the needle, and the needle takes out the flu the excess um, air. Uh, basically, one thing that's very important in these um, procedures is that you always put it in the upper border of the rib below though, so that you avoid the uh, puncturing the bundle or like the neurovascular bundle. So if this is a rib and this is a rib, you always try to put it closest to the upper border of the below rib and stay as far away from the upper lip rib as possible so that you don't puncture the neurovascular bundle which is found right below the rib, you know. So it's one of those important things to know. You know you're always trying to be far away from the rib that's above so you're as close as possible to the rib below that way you will avoid any injury to any structures 
the tube thoracostomy is similar to the needle, but the location is different. The location is in the fifth intercostal space, and you insert it like this, and you insert the tube, and the tube also gets rid of all the fluid, whether it's a blood or pus or just fluid. So a treatment had that the pleural effusion, pneumothorax, hemothorax, is either a needle thoracostomy or a tube thoracostomy. A tube thoracostomy is also sometimes called a chest tube. Sometimes they just call it just you. So next thing we're going to be talking about is the pulmonary ligament. The pulmonary ligament is an area near the hilum of the lung where the parietal and visceral pleura become continuous. So the parietal and visceral pleura connect with each other. And they form this cuff. Now this cuff surrounds the structures of the hilum of the lung. So if this is the hilum of the lung, this structure or this cuff around it is the, is the pleural ligament, uh, pulmonary ligament. Come on. Now the pulmonary ligament, like usually they'd ask you about it in the ER or in the oral exams. And they usually just ask you to identify it and to tell us the function of it. Um, extra information is that it's at the level of the second coastal cartilage, not that important, but like it starts forming at the level of the second coastal cartilage going downwards. Um, important thing to know is that the function of it is that it allows movement of vessels and the bronchi during respiration. So during respiration, it allows the movement to the hilum of the lung. So that's why it's important. So only two things you need to know in the pulmonary ligament is, is, is uh, a thickening of the parietal and visceral pleura joining together. And that the function of it is that it allows movement of vessels and bronchi during respiration. Come on, these are the two important things here. Okay, cool. Anyone has any questions so far? Okay, so next thing we'll talk about is the lung. Now the lung, I'm not going to be talking about much about the lung because it's not that much of an area of question as much as the pleural. So the surface anatomy of the lung is important because it gets mixed up with the surface anatomy of the pleura a lot. So a lot of people mix up between lung and pleura. Now, as I said last time, is that the pleura is outside the lung. So the pleura will have a more wider or like larger numbers when it comes to the anatomy of it. It's the apex anterior and um, anterior are almost the same. So we'll only focus on the uh, inferior border. So the inferior border of the lung is different from the inferior border of the pleura by the fact that you'll just subtract two. So when we were talking about the pleura, we said eight, 10, 12, right? So we said eight, 10, 12. Here it's six, eight, 10. So six, eight, 10. So if you look at the lung at the mid clavicular line, it'll be at the sixth rib. If you look at the lung at the mid axillary line, it'll be the eighth rib. If you look at it posteriorly, it'll be the 10th rib. Unlike the pleura, which was at the 8th rib, 10th rib, and 12th rib, right? So this is the thing you need to memorize. In the feet and lung, it's 6, 8, 10, while for the pleura, it's 8, 10, 12. Question? Let me explain it. Let me see. Okay, let's imagine if it was made, right? So, we have the lung, we have to be nice like this, right? So, at the middle, at the mid-clavicular line, it will be fee level. If the mid-axillary line has come fee level, and posteriorly, it will be level to one time. Okay? So, the mid-clavicular will be level of verb 6, while mid-axillary, level of verb 8, and posteriorly, it will be level of verb 10. تمام؟ يلا تاني عندنا الفلورا، الفلورا هي أوطى من اللنك، بتكون نازلة كده، تمام؟ سو so بتكون في الـ level of 8, 10, 12، يعني في الحتة اللي بيكون فيها اللنك 6، الفلورا بتكون 8، الحتة اللي بيكون فيها اللنك 8، الفلورا بتكون 10، 
الحته اللي بتكون في اللونج 10 البلور بتكون 12 البلور دايما بتكون اوطى من اللونج سو so, انت الزول احفظ واحده من الاثنين وبس يا يعني ازيد اثنين يا يعني انقص اثنين يعني if you memorize the lung as 6, 8, 10 if you ask about, if you're asked about the plura just say 8, 10, 12 make sense يعني if you were to look at the lung at the level of mid clavicular line it's at the level of 6 6th rib and في المت, mid axillary line it's at the level of 8th rib and posteriorly it's at the level of the 10th rib while when you're looking for plura you just add 2 to each so a plura it's an 8 10 12 got it شكرا تمام يلا دي برضه الكويشنز حقتها دايما بتجي يعني نظام بيسالوك انه someone got stabbed at the level of kida do you expect to find the lung there or not do you think the lung would be punctured or not stuff like that Sometimes they ask it straightforward, but usually they would ask it that way. Like from the actual back end, if you were to, in the back, literally, I just don't have a picture of the back, but in the back, the lung is more down than in the front. Make sense? So posteriorly, near the vertebral column, it will reach up to the level of the tenth rib, but that's it, it'll stop there. I don't have a picture. No, I don't have a picture, sadly. طيب any more questions في ال شرف السناتمي طيب so next thing you need to know is ال fissures of the lungs so في two fissures عندنا ال Oblique fissure or horizontal fissure. Come on. Uh, sometimes they ask you about the surface anatomy of those two. So an oblique fissure is curved, so it begins mean where they get down. Huh? So yeah. It starts posteriorly and it comes anteriorly. So it begins at the spineless processes of a T4 posteriorly, crosses the fifth intercostal space laterally, it follows the sixth rib anteriorly. So it would start mini T4 here now. It'll cross T5. It'll cross T5 around here. And then it'll continue all the way till T6 in the front. So the oblique line goes through an oblique pattern. So it would reach all three, T4, 5, and 6. Or more like T4, and then the fifth intercostal space, and then the sixth rib. Well, so fifth intercostal space, sixth rib. Yellow horizontal stops basically level four. Not sad, level four is the most kind of So it's almost a straight line. It goes just to the level four, fourth level. And then it eventually intersects with the um, oblique fissure. Come on. Yeah, the oblique fissure. Crosses E4, 5 or 6. The horizontal, this is the 4 because it's straight. Um, Muhimma is that obviously a horizontal fissure is only found on the right lung, while the oblique fissure is found on both lungs. Important to know. Sometimes they'd ask you, usually, and I remember they usually ask about the horizontal, not the oblique. Like they would ask, at what level is the horizontal? And you just say level of T4 or else. Well, it's not that common of a question, it's rare, but it's good to know, yeah. Come on? Okay, I'll repeat. So basically, what I was saying is that the fissures of the lung, sometimes they ask you to name the surface anatomy or where a fissure is. So in the two fissures, in an oblique fissure, a horizontal fissure. The oblique fissure is curved, so it'll go past a lot of structures. It'll go past T4 posteriorly, and then it'll cross the fifth intercostal space laterally, and then it'll reach a sixth rib, anteriorly, so up until rib six. 
لكن ال horizontal fissure is just at one level so it's horizontal so it'll be at the level of T4 فتبدا من قدام at the level of T4 and it'll go backwards up until it intersects the oblique fissure تمام؟ Okay, so an oblique fissure splits the lung into two lobes, while the horizontal would split the lung into three, third lobes. So we have the first lobe, second lobe, third lobe. Come on. Okay. So the next thing you need to know, probably and like a really common area of question, is the difference between the right and left lung, and how to tell the difference between right and left lung. It's common both of the DR exams and orals and so on. So an easy way to tell is the amount of lobes. The right one has three lobes, while the left one has only two lobes. Um, fissures, as we said, the right one has two fissures because it has the oblique and horizontal, while a horizontal it exists. Well, in the left lung, it only has the oblique fissure and no horizontal fissure, as you can see here. We also have the fact that the right lung is always shorter and wider, while the left lung has a cardiac notch. And right below the cardiac notch, it has a structure called the lingula. No? Here. So it has this lingula, which is an extra structure found after the cardiac notch. So there you'll find them in the left lung, but you won't find them in the right lung. So these differences between right and left lung. Any questions? So, Sam, you can talk about the hilum of the lung. This is also an area of question, but it's not that common. Um, see the right hilum and bronchi split into two before it enters the lung. So, because I have many two bronchi, while in the left lung, and bronchi push as one bronchi and it splits inside the lung. So this harlena one bronchi at the hilum. So if you look at the hilum of the lung, the right one has two bronchi, while the left one only has one bronchus. Come on. Tani fee in the right hilum. So two bronchi in the right and one bronchus in the left. Fitani, one bronchial artery in the right, and two bronchial arteries in the left. Come on. Usually, we only focus on the first one, week, which is the amount of bronchi in each lung. So, two bronchi in the right, one bronchi in the left. It's important. The rest are not that important. Okay. So, just pay attention to the specific fact. If you're right, there's two bronchi, and the left, there's only one bronchi. And the bronchi itself. So the bronchi themselves have differences, and this one's a bit important for clinical reasons. Basically, our right main bronchi, our right main bronchus, is wider, shorter, and more vertical than the left one. Well, why is this important? It's important as if you ever yani, inhale an object, so it's your, an object is aspirated, you accidentally inhaled it, it'll always or most probably fall in the right lung. So an object will probably be in the right lung. And it never, usually never goes to the left. Then the left is not wide or short, and it's not vertical. You know, you should the right one more. But sometimes they ask questions about some child inhaling a coin or something, and they'd ask you, where would you expect the coin to be stuck? And the answer is always, yeah, right main bronchi or right lung. You know? Any questions? Okay. So, we can even think of men in the pleura or lung. Let me show the pericardium. So, the pericardium, in the future, 
Um, sure. You want me to repeat the bronchi? The bronchi. We're going to find the right main bronchus and left main bronchus. Come on. The right main bronchus. Few important facts. In it's wider and shorter and more vertical than the left bronchus. Ne? Because when clinically, if someone accidentally inhales an object or aspirates an object. An object will aspirate the deep, it will probably fall into the right lung, not more likely than the left lung. So sometimes they'd ask you a question and they'd be like, an object falls into, uh, like a child inhales a coin, where do you expect to find the coin? The answer is according to it's in the right main bronchus. Or they'd ask you, a child inhaled it and it fell in the right bronchus, why? And the answer would be, it's wider, it's shorter, it's more vertical. Make sense? Okay, come on. So, after that, we'll talk about the pericardium. Um, the pericardium is basically an outer covering of the heart. And we have two types of pericardium. We have fibrous pericardium, serous pericardium. You know, a serous pericardium, they use a pleura, they use a um, uh, peritoneum in the abdomen. So it has two layers, a parietal layer or visual layer. Like in an extra layer, here is my fibrous pericardium. And the fibrous pericardium is firmly attached below the central tendon of the diaphragm. So it attaches to the central tendon of the diaphragm. While the serous pericardium has the parietal, which lines the fibrous pericardium, and then it has the visceral, which is closely related to the heart. So, so the layers of the pericardium. It's not that important, but you should know it. Any, you should know it, but I don't remember much questions. He questions sometimes about the pericardial cavity. And basically, the pericardial cavity is the space between the two layers, and it has pericardial fluid. So it's space between the visceral and the parietal pericardium. Pitani questions sometimes about the pericardial sinuses. You know, the pericardial sinuses then, home are their areas in the pericardium where yeah, they're empty. So, V2, V oblique, V transverse. And oblique is usually found here, while the transverse is found between the vessels or the great vessels behind the great vessels. And they're important surgically because they help يعني, with um, ligation of the vessels. So, in heart surgery, you would insert your clamp or your, yeah, your clamp in between a sinus is built. But that's not really important, Yanni. Yeah, it it's just important to know in the heart and pericardium, see what pericardial sinus is there. So, again, I'll just show you the area. You know, an oblique is found here, while a transverse is found here, behind the, behind the great vessels. So, behind the aortopulmonary trunk, like you get down, and then a cavity pulmonary vein. I'll repeat again. In your the pericardial sinuses, which are spaces, I would flex spaces caused by reflection of the pericardium. The pericardium goes like that. It reflects. It forms a space in the middle. You know? So we have two um, pericardial uh, sinuses. Bahadisma oblique sinus, which is found here on the posterior surface. And then there is a transverse sinus which is found between the great vessels up here. And they're important during surgeries. So yes, we need to use them in surgical um, procedures. But yeah, you're, not, you know, you're not required to know any more details. Just, you know, they're used in surgeries. Come on. Zoom Take like five minutes and later again, um, seven forty five. Come on. <laughs> 